So I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump right in and get started here. So first slide I have for you guys today is just kind of a general itinerary of what I'll be going over today. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, pretty much here today just to share with you guys my process as far as it goes um, with creating modular kits. Uh, my hope is that, you know, at the end of the day, all of you guys feel a little bit more confident about breaking down your guys' environments and being able to utilize this kit workflow. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just start off with a little bit of an intro, just kind of give you a little bit of work history um, and kind of how I got started and started using, you know, kit creation in my own work. And then I'm going to go ahead and jump into just kind of a general overview of kits, um, just kind of breaking things down from like, you know, the bare minimum. There's a lot of information that goes behind kit creation and kind of like, you know, the methodology behind it. But hopefully this will kind of give you some, you know, do's and don'ts, some a little bit of benefits, um, kind of how I plan things out a little bit. And uh, just some, um, you know, just some things to watch out for. And, you know, really, really important is organization. Um, after that, we're going to go ahead and jump into the demo part. Of this uh of this workshop here which is going to be me just kind of um showing you guys a little scene that i've been working on it's still work in progress um but it i thought it would be a great example of just kind of the kit method um i'll be going and starting off by breaking down a block out for you guys um test out some scene pieces in unreal kind of show you like that you know that red iterative workflow um and then i'll be going over the difference between kind of doing a hard surface kit versus a more organic kit and then we'll go ahead and jump on to the part two of the demo, which is going to be more so the texturing aspect of it. I'll show you guys how you know I texture my kit pieces using tilers and trims, and then also the more organic method, which is using a little bit more of like masks. And then I'll kind of show you guys how we end up blending things to things together, different methods and different workflows, um, or you know how we get everything to look you know nice and tight at the end of the day. And then last but not least, I'll go ahead and wrap things up a little bit by touching up on the aspect of kit bashing, and share with you all some art station links that I've saved over the years. Um, that I've always found really, really useful. So hopefully you guys will be able to take a look at that and uh, take a look at some great artists, you know, who've done awesome stuff with kits. All righty. So to get things started again, um, yeah, like I said, and I'm a, an environment artist at Santa Monica. Um, I've been in the game industry for the past eight years now, and I pretty much started off by working on uh, MMOs. Um, when I was in school, I was actually an intern over at uh, Sony Online Entertainment, which is Ever, uh, which is the studio that produces like games like EverQuest. And I was just doing some props while I was there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just open up my art station for you guys. So we can kind of take a look at that. Scroll on down a little bit. Unfortunately, I don't have any art from back then just because, uh, you know, it's a long time ago and also a little bit outdated <laughs> at this point. So, um, but my first official full time job in the industry was actually at Intrepid Studios, um, which is also another MMO. Um, and it was, they were working on their first title, which was Ashes of Creation. And that, I would say, is probably where I got my introduction into starting to utilize the kit workflow a little bit more. Um, if you guys don't already know, MMOs are probably the biggest game you can try to make, and it really does help to be, um, you know, to cover a lot of ground by using this kind of kit workflow when you get to like when it comes down to like optimizing, and also just comes down to just producing a lot of different content. Um, you know, being able to utilize utilize kits is kind of where I, you know, first got started, um, and uh, yeah, it's helped out me ever since then. And I've started to realize that you know a lot of different studios across the board use a very similar workflow, if not that same workflow. Um, so yeah, all that to say that it's it's it was a it was a great start for me, but um, I worked there for about three years, and during that time I did a little bit of freelance. I did a little bit of you know on some mobile and some VR stuff. I don't have any of that up here just because it's more so under NDA. But I also was doing some art station challenges um, on the side, and those really started to open up some doors in the industry in general. Um, I think just being able to kind of like you know show like my process and my breakdown, and also kind of like you know how I work really does you know did kind of again open up opportunities at different jobs. Um, so I thought that was a great aspect of, uh, of, of doing those. Um, but after about three years, you know, I wanted to start working on more AAA titles. And so I ended up going to a studio called High Moon Studios and working on um, the Call of Duty franchise, uh, mainly as a material artist. Um, I was there for about, I want to say like a little over a year. And uh, during that time, just learned so much about the entire pipeline for game creation as a whole. Um, and uh, you know, it was really honestly, it was it was, it was a really awesome job. Uh, but then I got a really really great opportunity to come to uh, Santa Monica up in LA and um, work on you know the new God of War, uh, which is God of War Ragnarok. And for the past I want to say three and a half years now, I've been up here just working on that title. And yeah, we're just cooking up some really awesome stuff. Um, and hopefully you guys can you know check out my station when you guys get a chance. Uh, but yeah, did, was able to make uh, a lot of content for that one, so it's uh, it's really fun. But let's go ahead and just jump onto the next slide, which is um, more so, uh, you know, the reason why we're all here to talk a little bit about kits. All righty. 
So, like I said, there's a lot of information about kits that you know I would love to cover and uh, you know talk about and show about uh, different examples about. So I'm just going to kind of just tackle this thing as like a broad stroke at first. Um, and if you guys have any questions or you know want to learn anything else, uh, any further, anything further about kits, um, feel free to kind of throw them in the chat, right? Um, but to start things off, um, do, 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 do. Um, this slide is pretty much all about the great things that are you know the great things about using kits and probably all the stuff that you'll want to know uh, when planning things out. Um, I always like to start off by comparing kits to Legos, right? Um, we reuse the same pieces over and over and over again in new and interesting ways. And, uh, you know, we just find different ways that they fit together and different ways they can, like, work together, um, you know, within our engine. And so the whole point is us creating our kit pieces and our modeling software, our Lego pieces, you might say, and being able to bring them into the engine and just reuse them over and over and over again, um, you know, in all a bunch of cool different interesting ways we start off by building off like you know little set pieces then building out entire environments and then next thing you know we're building out entire worlds right um but as far as the pipeline goes in general um when you do end up using this kind of workflow it does really set you up for you know creativity iteration and just sharing of assets between projects and also other people that you might be working with um if you're working at a studio uh, with this workflow too, it also does, you know, set yourself up for success at the end of production, which is really, really important. And it's one of those things that you don't really hear people talking about a whole lot. Um, but at the end of the day, you will have to, you know, touch all these kit pieces or touch all your art over and over and over again. And, um, you know, it really does help to kind of have a non-destructive workflow, you might say. And honestly, this working with kits in general is just kind of a win-win-win across the board. Um, I also got want to go ahead and touch up a little bit about kind of like how I would like to plan on my kits and some things that you know you kind of might want might want to look out for. Some ways I, I kind of think about kits in general. Um, I usually like to think about kits as being you know one or two things or maybe even a mixture of both. Um, but I usually like to separate between hard surface stuff and more organic stuff. The hard surface stuff might be a little bit more architectural, and it might be just like you know actually like Lego pieces snapping together, and you're going to want to have like you know work on your seams and things like that. Um, whereas working with a little bit more of an organic kit is you. You, it allows for a little bit of, I guess, geometry kind of mashing together and kind of, you know, pretty much having a little bit of a seam or some of that. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about those and show you some examples in a bit. Um, another thing you might want to also ask yourself too is like, how big of this environment or how big am I going to, how often am I going to be using these kit pieces? Because the larger the environment, honestly, the larger the kit pieces. Um, a great example of this might be like if you were making a giant, you know, a giant city, right? It probably wouldn't do you a whole lot of good to like maybe like make an individual kit piece of let's say like a window or something like that. You might want to start tackling things as like an entire floor or an entire building um, per se. Because when you are inside of your engine and you're placing things and you're building things around, you're probably going to want to you know make it easier on yourself as far as like being able to build out new content and having you know all that to say. The larger the environment, the larger the kit pieces, right? Another aspect of kind of kits that I like to kind of plan for is Focusing on my large and medium and small pieces, um, just think of it like a painting, right? Or, um, or you know, treat it like any form of art. And on that note, you know, uh, I usually end up starting off with large and medium pieces first, just because you know it's make things a little bit more simple. Um, once I start getting too much into the details, like the small individual bricks, um, you know, I can almost just kind of get overwhelmed by how many kit pieces that I have going on. But the last part about this is kind of just talking about like the different materials that you're going to be using. I usually like to kind of write down all the different textures that I'm going to be needing to texture my kit assets and really kind of deciphering like whether I you know really need an entire 2K by 2K you know tileable metal if I'm just doing like a wood architectural kit. Maybe I can get away with using some trim or some sort of atlasing um, you know to help consolidate the amount of textures that I I end up using. Um, one last little note, uh, noteworthy bit that I kind of have under here, if you guys saw this little, you know, warning sign at the very, very bottom, is that this workflow has 100 percent, you know, it's the way to go. And I would say the only trade off or the one big trade off for this workflow is at the end of the day, you might end up having a lot of game object or draw call limits in your guys' environments. And this, again, has to do more so with production, but it's worth mentioning um, and then kind of how to resolve this. But Pretty much, there is an actual limit to the number of pieces that you want to have in your scene. Um, a great example might be like, let's say, like a little patch of grass, right? I place this patch of grass like a hundred thousand times, and yeah, sure, maybe it is all instance and still kind of like working together. But there could be uh, times where those are still drawing the number of materials, you know, a thousand different times, or maybe it's drawing the game object. The, the individual plant a thousand different times. And so your engine may resolve this, it may or may not, um, but at work when, uh, when we have this issue come up, usually what we have to do is just combine all those uh, 
all those grass patches and then just into one gigantic model. Right. This way, it's all being rendered and it's all being loaded up at the same exact time. And that, you know, those thousand game objects now turn into just one, and those thousand draw calls now just turn into just one. Um, so, just something to kind of keep in mind. We will kind of look for pieces in our kit at the end of the day when our environment's all set up and kind of merge them together, just so it's not, you know, super complex. And once we do that, it is a more permanent state of our environment, and we usually don't go back to iterate after that. But hopefully, that gives you kind of just a general overview of kits. Um, let's go ahead and just move on to the next slide here. All righty. So another aspect that I wanted to touch on here is, um, you know, how complex should we be making our kits, right? Um, I always, just kind of as a baseline, um, I always like to think less is more and to start simple, right? Keep it super duper simple at the very, very base, um, at, I guess at the very, very start. You can always add to your kit and you can always make iterations and stuff like that. And I'll kind of talk to you guys about, you know, when and how we should be making iterations. But I usually like to, again, treat it like a painting, right? Start off with the broad strokes, get all those base pieces in there. And as we need to, we'll start detailing up and adding more to this, um, to the environment little by little. Um, but on that note, let's go ahead and say that uh, I would maybe say like a rule that I use a lot is I always like to establish the minimum number of pieces that I'm making just to establish the overall look of the scene is kind of like my way to go, right? So I'll just bring in like one wall, you know, one pillar or, you know, one floor piece and just kind of use that to build out my environment as much as I can. And if I need things to start being, you know, looking more interesting or looking different, I'll bring in or make new kit pieces, right? And I kind of just want to do that across the board and keep my kit limited to the least amount of pieces as possible, right? Not only is it going to help you at the end of the day, um, you know, so you don't have to make so much different content, but it also will stop you from bringing in objects that you may or may not use, right? Because what if you make like 500 rocks and then you bring all those in and you only end up using like three or four, you know, there was really, it was just kind of a waste of time to kind of make all those different variations. Or maybe it isn't if you're just kind of experimenting and planning things out, but it is worth mentioning. Um, next up is, uh, you know, one of the basics, or as I, I should say, um, one of the big things that I always get, like get asked when I talk about kits is kind of like, okay, like how much should I be adding and when should I be expanding? And so I kind of wrote down a couple different scenarios that I usually find very, very useful when expanding my kit. Um, the first one being variation, right? Like when should we be making variants of stuff? Let's say you put in a wall and you're seeing it seven times, you know, lined up next to itself. Um, it is probably a good moment or a good time to say like, hey, I'm seeing a lots of different walls on my screen at the same time, I should probably start getting variants going. And so that's a good time to start expanding your kit a little bit. Um, I have a little you know, image down here for you guys as well, just so you can see like, yeah, just to start creating variants if you're seeing it on the, on the screen at the same time, it's a good one to, to use. Uh, next up, if you end up detailing your guys' environments um, and you want to start adding more to your kit, that's a good time to start expanding your kit. Um, a good example is on the left here, let's say like I just put down some walls and maybe some roofs or something like that. And now I want to start adding some, you know, like some like maybe yeah, roof pieces or maybe some edge cap pieces to kind of make my silhouette a little bit more interesting and detailed. Um, I also may want to make a new kit overall. Like let's say I wanted to add like, you know, some drain pipes and stuff like that. Maybe a whole separate kit just for that uh, would be really, really useful. So therefore I'm expanding my, my, my kit or my scene kit, I should say. Um, and then the last one is probably one that we use as gamers in game development a lot, which is like destruction, right? If we start to start breaking things apart and damaging our pieces and we need little rubble piles and individual bricks later on to kind of scatter around or little pieces of wood to scatter around and debris, um, that's a good time to start expanding your kit, right? So yeah, just one little section right there. And then last but not least, I will say that the more you use the kit, in general. So let's say you guys end up making a kit for like a small scene or something like that. And you think to yourself, you know what, I want to build out like an entire environment, like with this thing now, maybe or an entire level sized scene. Um, the more you end up using your kit, the more you're going to want to start adding to your kit and expanding your kit. This may be mean just, you know, doing some material swaps. This may be making new kinds of pieces. Maybe you have an entire kit for, you know, building set A and that can give you like, you know, hundreds of variations of buildings, but then you might want to do a building set B kit just to like, you know, get more variety in your guys' environment. So on that note, that's when to start, you know, expanding further along, but it does all start with kind of keeping it simple at first. Let's go ahead and keep going on here. All right. So this next part is a little bit more of like, I wouldn't say it's the uh, boring part, but it is super duper important into how we design and how we plan out our kits, which is to keep things a little bit more, you know, organized. Um, 
and it is really, really crucial to the fundamentals of kits. Um, and it's going to play a, a very important part, you know, as we continue to texture and as we continue to kind of bring these assets in engine. And especially if you're going to hand this kit over to somebody else to to use, um, you're going to want things to kind of work out. And all that really comes down to is, you know, sticking to the grid, right? I usually like to, or I guess what I've learned across, like, you know, working on like Call of Duty and then over at um, uh, on God of War is that we usually like to stick a lot to meters. For some reason, that just seems to be a great kind of measurement size for us to establish not only the text density, but also the pixels per meter. Um, and it is, I have found it to be a very, very useful size as far as like making sure that your pieces snap together. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on the game that you're working on, your text latency might stay the, you know, might be a little bit different here and there. But more often than not, we are thinking in meters. Um, on that point, too, um, keeping your your pieces on the grid and snapping to the grid, um, just it's just going to make assembly inside of your uh, inside of your game engine that much easier. And it's also going to make texturing so much easier. Um, once we get to the texturing portion of this demo, hopefully you guys will see that there is a reason why we, we, we end up making pieces and try not to, you know, have some random piece that's off the grid or maybe even like, you know, a third or a fourth, you know, sticking of a meter. We try to keep things snapping to the meters. Um, another important aspect of this is pivot points. Pivot points is a little bit, it's going to vary a lot, more, uh, you know, piece by piece. I will say for more of the architectural stuff, you're going to want to make sure that your pivot point is in a spot that allows your pieces to snap together and be used together. Um, you don't, what you don't want to be doing in engine is fiddling around like, you know, off of the grid and trying to get things to look just right. Um, it can be really, really annoying. And honestly, when things kind of snap together and are, you know, snapping to the grid, it's just going to make assembling a lot easier and a lot more, you know, straightforward. Um, so yeah, and then if you guys are doing more organic stuff, the pivot point, you know, I usually like to put my pivot point somewhere in the center of my object, just so I can start to like, you know, have the freedom to rotate it around and not have to be, you know, having a pivot point in a weird spot. Uh, that's all it kind of goes down when it comes to, or that's all, that's what it comes down to when it comes to pivot points. Uh, next up though, I want to go ahead and talk to you guys about kind of testing your kit pieces. So this is really, really important um, when you guys are doing early on stuff, and I'll probably something I'll I'll touch up on when we do the blockout version or when we're breaking down a blockout, is that you do want to kind of test out your kit pieces either in Maya or in Engine um, over and over and over again, just to make sure that they are working together in a very useful way um, before you decide to like, hey, start sculpting these pieces, or before you decide to start, you know, adding more detail to the modeling. Um, just make sure that you're actually making sure that these pieces are going to be useful and that they're working correctly. And then last but not least um, is more so the naming convention of it all. Um, you know, it's just kind of this thing about staying organized. And one thing that I've kind of found, thanks to one of my coworkers at, um, at Santa Monica, is that to not use numbers and more so use the alphabet, right? Uh, a great example is just kind of these, these bottom uh, to uh, pieces right here, I'll have like wall window A, and then my variation will be wall window B. And if I need more variants, I can call it C, D, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, but this is just a lot better than just calling it wall window one or something like that, just because then I'll have, you know, what happens to wall 37? Is that wall two variant or is that wall one variant? So yeah, using the alphabet is just kind of usually the way to go. But on that note, we covered all this stuff. Let's go ahead and jump right on here. Oh, I should probably touch this or add this real quick here. I have this image over here that I tend to use a lot of times with my students and also something that I kind of like um, have found to be a perfect one-to-one -one when it comes to Maya. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from, you know, whatever modeling software you are using, but just making sure that your, you know, modeling software is set up correctly to whatever engine you're working with is is kind of, you know, fundamental. It's a must-have. All righty. So, on that note, um, let's go ahead and get started into the demo aspect of, uh, of today's workshop. So I'm just going to go ahead and exit out of this real quick here. Let's open up Embryo. All righty. So before we start diving in, again, this is uh, still a work in progress environment here, but to let you guys know what we're doing. So pretty much I have this environment right here in Unreal, and it's still a very work in progress. It, very, it started off just kind of like as like just a little corner section of this room and eventually I'm starting to expand it a little bit more and who knows maybe I'll end up you know adding an upstairs to this thing a little bit later on but just so you guys can kind of get an idea of what we'll be working with and what we'll kind of like end up getting towards at the end of the day it's going to be something that kind of looks like this all right let's go ahead and jump over to Maya real quick here all right, so like I said we're going to go ahead and start off by taking a block out of something like this as you can see in this block out I usually like to just go bananas with my block out in the very beginning just like you can't model enough personally because you can always you know 
down res it or even make it a little bit more optimal at the end of the day. Um, or you can even turn some stuff like this, like let's say like the ground pieces and stuff like that. I end up turning that into texture detail. Um, and, you know, but I do want to model it in just so I kind of have like an idea of what it's going to look like at the end of the day. And um, personally, in my opinion, I don't think you can model too much. Like I always tell, you know, people like when in doubt, model it out, right? Um, but we're going to go ahead and just take a section of this guy and just show you how I quickly just like will take a block out like this. That's kind of like, you know, just a bunch of random pieces um, and uh, get it ready to get into the engine. So first thing I'll end up doing um, whenever I'm doing this stuff is try to stay a little bit organized as far as like my outliner goes. Um, but I will actually end up taking my entire object and exporting it out into the engine so that I have a basically a footprint of my end scene. So when I start to put my kit pieces together, I at least have something that like I can reference inside of my engine later on. And I'll go ahead and show you guys this in a second when we're actually testing out our kit pieces. Um, but I will kind of leave that all in a folder right there for myself, just so I can kind of know like, hey, this is still in the block out phase. And then I'll actually start to pull out things like my kit pieces and my props um, as I need them. So for this whole environment, I can you know spend forever trying to you know turn this into a kit. But I'm just going to go ahead and grab a little section, which is this left hand section over here. Let's go ahead and just kind of hide my block out for a moment. Pull this out here. So as you can see, these are just random pieces. Some of them are onto the grid. Some of them aren't. Um, it just depends on like how I was working for with uh, working on my pieces. Knowing what I know about kits, my blockouts tend to be nowadays a little bit more, you know, I am keeping the grid in mind. Uh, but if you're not, it's still fine. You can still go bananas. And uh, what you want to end up doing, though, at the end of the day is making sure that your pieces do kind of snap to the grid. It's actually better that they are on the grid versus like real world scale, in my opinion. Um, obviously, you want to do your best, especially when it comes to props and, and just like, you know, the size of a doorway. But even in general, I try to keep my pieces more so on the grid than anything. All right, let's go ahead and start off with this little section here. So in this section, I have a couple different things that I might want to split up into different kit pieces. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off actually with just taking a look at this kind of like, you know, this little, what we might you, what you might consider a prop. Um, this is probably not going to be a part of my kit. It's probably going to be something that I'm going to texture one off. I might end up using, you know, trim sheets or something like that later on if I, if I wanted to. But I'm just going to actually go ahead and drop this in a little a folder right here that I already labeled kit uh, props for us. Just so that I know that, like, hey, I don't have to worry about this right now. Let's go ahead and put it in that folder. And I can go ahead and hide that, that folder right here. So we're not going to worry about that guy at the moment. Um, next up, I'm going to go ahead and, like, work on this wall piece here first. So if we go ahead and just kind of move this over for a second here. Do, 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 do. Oops, we also got this thing. Let me turn off blur. There we go. Move my pillar off to the side. Let's go ahead and just work on a little wall section. Usually walls and floors are, like, my first go-to, just so I can kind of establish just the foundation of my, of my scene here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, snap my pivot point for all this towards the edge and just kind of line it up. Um, real quick, I want to kind of touch a little bit on text density in general. Um, so like I said before, I have my scene set up one for one for uh, for Unreal. But on that note, you know, I can spend forever talking about text density. But pretty much each one of these little squid, uh, square, squid, each one of these little squares is a 512, um, you know, per meter or a, a one meter long, which is about roughly a 512 texture. Um, so if I go ahead and just like, you know, guess them, and I guess it, but you know, do a little math here, four of these across is going to be the actual size of a 2048. And that's actually how I want to start building out my pieces at first, knowing, you know, at the end of the day that what it will take to texture, like, let's say, like, you know, this wall piece is roughly going to be the size of a 2K across the board. Same thing goes if I end up making like, let's say like a, you know, two meter piece, it'll only be like a 1024 texture. Or if I make a one little piece, I'll know that, uh, or sorry, a one meter piece, it'll just be like a 512 texture. So I kind of try to keep that in mind when I'm, you know, building out my kit piece. And usually I end up working on a lot of 2Ks at first. So I will go ahead and, you know, make sure my pieces are roughly around like four meters. All right, so on this note, let's go ahead and just grab this wall here. So honestly, it really is just about kind of making sure that, you know, your vertices kind of snap up in the correct ways. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab some of these vertices and make sure that they snap exactly four meters. Let's say this is going to be my back wall here. Let's go ahead and grab like something like this. I'm just going to make sure all my vertices snap up nice and easy. So just go ahead and using like pivot point mode or sorry, I guess uh, setting my pivot to, uh, to my vertice mode just to make sure that it does snap. And it's literally just me just kind of moving these vertices across until I make sure that they are, you know, lining up on the grid. All right. And then you might see that I actually have some, like, block out here for what might be, you know, some wallpaper peeling a little bit later on. I may want to put this on all my kit pieces later on, or 
but you know, maybe some walls aren't torn up, right? Maybe some walls are nice and clean. Um, maybe this is something that I end up adding as like a separate kit piece altogether. In this case, I'm not, I don't want to worry about it right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and put it back in my blockout mode. And just kind of leave it over there because I just want to, again, just kind of keep it simple at first. And if I need those pieces, I can always just go back into the blockout um, section of my uh, scene here and just kind of add them in as a new kit piece or part of all my kit pieces or some of that. Or maybe I want to make it a variant. All right, let's go ahead and do this guy right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of snap them over here. It looks like these pieces snap up nice and nice and good, so not too worried about that. Let's go ahead and merge that together. Everything else looks like it's starting to snap up. All right, so this piece looks like it's all good to go. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of merge this down here, and I'd probably start to label this guy. And I'll go ahead and start dropping it in my kit piece, uh, sorry, my kit folder when I feel that it's in a good spot. Let's go ahead and call this one like wall. I'm going to call it four meter, or so four M. Whoops, four M. A, right? Oops, I'm starting to add a bunch of different characters in here that I don't really want to add. All righty, cool. And I know that I'm going to probably later on like want to have some, you know, some different size pieces. I don't want to be just limited to this one kit piece. So maybe I'll end up making like a two meter piece as well. So I'll just go ahead and just like duplicate this model over here for a second. Oops, actually, I'll move this guy off to the side. Go back and grab this one just because it's already named properly. And let's go ahead and turn this into like a little quick little two meter piece right here. So if I start to grab some of those vertices here, and again, I'm not worried about unwrapping or anything like that. I'm literally just trying to get the block out for my kit, um, you know, working first. So it doesn't matter if I'm like, you know, stretching my UVs or something weird. All right, so I got a two meter piece here. So I'm just going to go ahead and just go down over here and let's just call this one, keep it A, call this one two meter. Oops, I actually didn't put M before, so that's my mistake here. Let's go ahead and just quickly add that in. But it is good to stay organized, right? So I know my pieces. And I know that everything in this folder is something that I'm going to end up exporting out when I'm done. And in fact, let's go ahead and just kind of fix my pivot point just so I know exactly where um, you know all my pieces would be. Um, go ahead and just kind of line them up right there. And it looks like I do want to probably, I will, I will probably want to have my pivot point in a very useful spot. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and put it right in between, you know, where my flat plane is. Um, and this is just so I can have my, give myself a little bit of a back face. By the way, I've had, there's some questions sometimes where it's like, hey, should I be like even modeling this back faces? Like, isn't that kind of like wasted geometry a little bit? Personally, when it comes to lighting, I kind of want my scene to, you know, light pretty well. And I don't have, I want to have to worry about adding, you know, back faces or double siding my materials. So I usually add just a little bit of a geometry. I feel like it's not too much extra to add. And if for some reason, let's say that like, I don't know, I'm really running into an issue with geometry at the end of the day or polygon counts. Um, I can always just come back and just delete those back faces. But, you know, whenever I'm developing my kit pieces at first, I will give it some sort of thickness and then, you know, worry about it later on down the line, right? Again, it's an iterative workflow, so not too worried about it. Let's go ahead and make sure that this pivot point snaps up. And again, always good to kind of just test your kit pieces out. I'm holding X as I'm moving things on the grid and making sure that they are, you know, actually snapping. So this is just a great way to kind of also just test your stuff in engine real quick here. All right, so these pieces look like they're almost good to go. Let's go ahead and put those off to the side. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and hide my kit for now, just so that's off to the side. Let's go ahead and talk about this guy. Actually, you know what? Let me turn those back on. I'll just kind of move them off the side here because I will want to make this sure this piece also does snap. So this is a piece that's also kind of like off the grid a little bit. Maybe this doorway size is actually perfect, um, you know, the way it is. But again, like I was saying before, I actually would rather it be on the grid than not. So if I, that means just, you know, extending my doorway just a little bit further just to make sure that it matches, I will do that. If I didn't want, you know, a larger, you know, walkway or a larger doorway, I'll just try to make sure that my piece, even though it's not like, you know, it looks a little bit offset, I will make sure that it still, for the most part, snaps to the edge of the grid. So it doesn't really matter where you end up putting the doorway itself, as long as this is going to be like, let's say, for instance, a four meter piece. If I wanted it to be less, like let's say I wanted it to be like more of like a three meter piece, that's totally fine as well, but I will have to kind of like accommodate for this doorway. And this can be kind of like anywhere, you know, just depends on the sizing of your, of your scene that you're trying to do. But in this case, let's go ahead and leave it as like a nice little four meter piece. Let's go ahead and just kind of make sure that it lines up with my one of my wall pieces here. So I'm just going to go ahead and snap that right there. All of the trims look like they already do. For this guy right here, I'm just going to go ahead and let's say I want to end up like mirroring this a little bit later on. By the way, this is a tool that I use a lot. Uh, a buddy of mine showed me this, you know, pretty much when I first started in the industry. And I honestly, I will never stop using it. It's super duper great. But it's just kind of this mirror tool over here. It's literally just one line of code, which is super duper great. And if you guys want it, I can always kind of share it with you. But as you can see here, it allows me to kind of make some like, you know, corner pieces or even just kind of like quickly mirror something super simple. 
Do, 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 do. But yeah, I'm just going to give it a little bit of thickness there. Cool. All righty. Let's go ahead and get rid of this model for a second, or that little plane there. And then again, I'm just going to go ahead and say like something like this. All right, so this is where it kind of gets a little bit fun here, but let's go ahead and start cutting things up so that it works with my new piece here. And so you might be asking yourself a little bit like, John, like, why are you, uh, like, why don't you make like, let's say like this piece a separate, uh, separate model, or let's say like the trim up top a separate model. Um, and pretty much what it comes down to is, again, I want the least amount of pieces in my environment as possible. Um, and I always try to ask myself too, like, will I ever need to put this wainscoting, you know, without this wall, or will I ever need this wall without this wainscoting? Maybe at one point I might, you know, end up wanting a piece of wall that doesn't have that wainscoting in case I wanted to do like some damage version. But more often than not, I don't think I'm ever going to place that wainscoting piece without a wall. So hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of insight of kind of like why I chose to do, you know, include it all into one kit piece. It's just for ease of placement. And if, again, if I need a version of the wainscoting, let's say I want to do like a broken version of wainscoting just like on the floor, I'll make a version of that, right? But I'm trying not to get ahead of myself by like being like, oh, like, you know, separating out too many pieces, like limit the number of pieces that you guys are making um, just so it makes it a little bit easier for you in general as far as like placing things in engine. So let's go ahead and grab this guy. I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of whoops. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't be clicking things. All right. Let's go ahead and just kind of deselect that. Oops. Should go ahead and deselect this side right there. Deselect these vertices real quick here. Okay. Let's go ahead and make sure all this stuff kind of snaps along. Oops. Boom, 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 boom. All right. And we'll focus on kind of like fixing that a little bit later. But just for the general guide, I just want to make sure that I get this piece in here. I can always update these pieces if for some reason I get it in engine. It's like, hey, that doesn't really you know snap the way it's supposed to or look the way it's supposed to. Right, it's all just kind of at this point still blocking out my entire kit. So let's go ahead and just find something like that. Do you select this stuff? Yeah. Oh, whoops. Let's go ahead and just kind of snap it to that vertice there for a moment. Cool. All righty. And so at the end of the day, I'll have something that kind of looks like this. Let's go ahead and call this one mesh combined. Delete history, free transformations on it. Don't worry about that mirror group right there. Let's call this one wall. Maybe instead of wall, maybe I might call this one a wall doorway. And then it'll be a four meter piece. And I'll just leave it as A because it's its first variant. Maybe I end up needing a variant where it's, you know, destroyed or, you know, whatever. Maybe it has a wallpaper on it or something weird. All righty. I will also make sure that all my pivot points or all my models are kind of, you know, locked up into the same uh, zero to one space so that when I do end up exporting it out, you know, my pivot point is where it needs to be on the model itself. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can like export this stuff out in as like a batch or something like that. Um, usually I end up just doing it by hand just so I can have a little bit more control. It does take a little bit longer, but unless I have a million pieces, um, then I might end up starting to use batch export at some point. Um, also real quick here, I do have this model for a second here. Um, I wanted to kind of just show you guys why I kind of add this model. So I'm just going to go ahead and move this stuff off to the side. But more often than not, it's actually kind of nice to have an in-between piece, uh, not only for breakup of your, you know, just straight up geometry, but also um, it's good just to kind of have like, um, you know, a little bit of variation for your wall. Because let's say if I had like, I'm just going to move this off to the side for a second here. Let's say I had a wall in my scene that had like, you know, a bunch of different, you know, just repeating walls. And let's say that I got it to tile, you know, my tileable textures to tile seamlessly across the board. I still would probably want to have something in here as far as like breakup goes. And usually I like to think of this as like, you know, a sandwich technique, right? If I had like something bare and then I have something, you know, interesting as far as detail goes, maybe I'll end up doing this as a, like a one-off prop or one-off sculpt piece um, just to kind of make it a little bit, you know, some variation or break up of my towel textures or my trims. Um, but I would say like having like some sort of cat piece like this is just really, really nice to have. Um, but I'll probably end up having this guy as its own separate piece altogether. So let's go ahead and just add it to my kit here for a second. Let's just call this one like pillar wall. Okay, cool. All righty. And then so let's go ahead and just drag everything over here, send it to pivot point. And then I'm going to go ahead and just kind of ex export these pieces out. Um, oh, one thing real quick here I wanted to add before I do that for a second here. Let's go ahead and just duplicate this piece here for a moment. And again, it's just more so showing off that. Whoops, selecting so many different things. It's more again showing off that nice little mirror tool is that like why I love doing this is because it allows me to create some like corner pieces 
and allow them to kind of snap. So let's say like I wanted to go ahead and like make this corner base. Don't worry about the green. It's just basically breaking the material setup, but I'm not too worried about that. Let's go ahead and just kind of do something like this. Just kind of eyeball it for a moment. All right. So now I have a little corner piece of my scene. If I if I wanted to have like you know a place where these kind of like seam up and match up at the end of the day, let's go ahead and just assign existing material to it again, Lambert for the for the moment. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my one of my wall pieces here, just duplicate it just so I can have it over here. Make sure that the, that these vertices all line up and match up the way that they're supposed to. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say like grab the vertices like this here. I'm gonna deselect these guys for a moment. I'm just gonna go ahead and find that pivot point or that vertice. And make sure that it actually snaps to a piece that is already on the grid, which is going to be this other section over here. So kind of go ahead and make sure it snaps. I'm just holding X, by the way, to kind of make sure that it snaps to the grid or vertice mode to make sure that it snaps to the vertice of this model. And then pretty much now I have this piece. And as long as I put my pivot point, it doesn't really matter where I put my pivot point as long as it's on the grid. I can put my pivot point over here. I can put it in the corner. I'm just making sure that my pivot makes sure that it snaps to the grid. But now if I wanted to kind of just experiment with these two pieces, I can go ahead and just be like, all right, let's go ahead and just like grab this, grab that. And I know it's all going to snap together and work together, just like Legos. And I'll be able to build this stuff out inside of my engine. Nice and easy. Ta -da. Right. Again, just kind of making sure that that all works together. But it might seem very kind of like straightforward and simple, but um, you know, it's really good to kind of make sure that you have all this stuff down. And then make sure you have the essential pieces that you'll be needing to build out your environment. So now that I got all those pieces out, I'll go ahead and just kind of put them all in my folder. Make sure that they're all named properly. I'm not going to name it right now, just so I can kind of move on to the next part of the demo, which is testing out my kit pieces inside of Engine. I'll just export each one of these out. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump ahead into my Unreal scene, where I've already kind of imported them. So you guys don't have to watch me import each individual one. All righty. So, Whenever I have like my environments, I don't want to just start placing uh, my kit pieces inside of my environment. Um, I'll actually want to start testing these out by having it what we call like a, what I call like a zoo, which is what we call it a SMS or some sort of playground file, which allows me to kind of test out my kit pieces. And it almost also works as like a checklist for myself. Like I'll know like, hey, are there some kit pieces that I quite haven't haven't quite unwrapped yet? Are there some kit pieces that I need some variants of or whatever the heck? But also it works as like a general library. For myself so if i ever needed to come back to this or if i ever needed to see like what pieces i you know still have or can use in my scene i'll have them all laid out right here for me um to kind of you know view and easily uh come back to also in case i needed to you know let's say hand this off to a different artist they know what pieces are in my scene and what's part of my kit and they can kind of like you know put things together in their own special way but let's go ahead and go to this section right here where i've already imported some pieces um, that would be under here, hard surface stuff. All right, so like I said before, I will actually go ahead and bring in my entire, you know, block out of my scene as a whole, as again, like a thumbprint or like a, 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 a blueprint of kind of like where I should be placing my models. Also, you might've noticed that I just kind of dragged it into the scene. Um, that's actually not super duper smart. The way I have my grid set up is that each one of these meters is basically, you know, 50 units. So if I go ahead and just, I wanna make sure that I'm placing everything inside of my Unreal scene, to that grid. So this way it kind of snaps. See how it kind of just snapped there, the nearest grid. Um, keeping things on the grid is just a very, very smart, you know, workflow. And you want to make sure that you're not, again, having to readjust your pieces. And it almost looked like how I was basically, you know, attaching different models inside of Maya. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of grab this wall piece that I have here. Let's go ahead and throw it, quickly throw a light so I can kind of see inside of this room. And pretty much what I'll end up doing is going like this. I'll go ahead and just kind of like save this. Oh, sorry. Trying to make sure that all my pieces line up. They won't fit to my block out perfectly, but they'll fit in a pretty good spot, right? Let's say like, I'm going to go ahead and just do this piece right there, like that. And then again, it's just kind of using that that block out as just kind of, again, my, my kind of like my stencil for my scene. And I'll basically just start to rebuild out my entire environment. And when I'm ready, I'll go ahead and just like, let's say save this scene off as like my, my actual scene later on. But at least in here, I'm making sure that all my kit pieces work together, that everything you know works the way it's supposed to. And again, I'm making sure that everything kind of snaps. And again, I'll like, oh, not again, but I will end up like hiding this on and off to kind of make sure that like, oh, is this working out the way it's supposed to? Yeah, all right, it's gonna be somewhere like right there. Let's go ahead and just kind of move this over. Ta -da. All right, let's find my doorway that I had here, which is this guy. And then 
as you can see right here, I ended up updating this piece in general because you know thought it'd be a little bit more interesting, but I didn't know that until after I kind of got it in and started looking at my environment as a whole. Alrighty. Oops. Yeah, so as long as it ends up working, you know, the way the scene is intended to, it's more so that it follows, you know, more so that it looks good with my kit at the end of the day versus it trying to match my, you know, one-to-one -one of my block out. That block out, again, is just kind of a general guide. But yeah, hopefully that kind of gives you guys a little bit of insight about, like, the process of building your kit pieces out and then, you know, end up using them in engine. Um, and quickly, I'm going to go ahead and just jump over to a different scene. Uh, which is going to be more so of the uh, the part about the organic kit pieces, right? Because I feel like this is a little bit different to handle, or sorry, a different way to tackle in general, um, but also very, very similar. So unlike the more hard surface parts of it, where everything kind of snapped together like Legos, um, whenever I'm doing more organic uh, kits, again, I like to have my pivot point kind of in the center. And I usually like to kind of create pieces that are a little bit more so like large, medium, and small pieces, right? And kind of just like, you know, work my way down into the more like granular pieces as we go. Um, some general notes that I usually kind of make or some general pieces that I usually kind of make is something like this, where it's kind of like more of like a mound or a way to kind of blend assets together is really, really nice to have. Um, it's going to be a simple geometry piece that I can just start to like jam into like, let's say like this rock or something like that. Um, just to kind of help maybe bridge the gap between like a piece like this and then like a piece like this. All right. I also have, you know, some other little debris pieces that as well that I usually like to use to kind of help, you know, give detail to this scene. And also, again, it helps to bridge the gap between like certain models and, and other models. But that's pretty much all there is as far as like you know, creating your kit, depending on the kind of kit you're obviously trying to do. It might require some snapping and it might require just like, you know, some jamming of models together. But I want to go ahead and show you guys real quick here how like um, a kit like this would work. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and just do it in Maya, for example, just to kind of demonstrate. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and again start off with my uh, treat it like a painting, right? Start off with my large kit pieces. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab this rock for a second. And let's go ahead and just make like probably one of the easiest environments to kind of do, or the most straightforward straightforward environments to do, which is going to be some sort of like hallway. In this case, like some sort of probably like you know canyon corridor thing. And notice how I'm like when I'm placing these, I'm just going to kind of like start to rotate them so so they're not perfectly on like you know 90 degrees. I'm going to maybe maybe end it like. Uh, Usually when it comes to like organic stuff, especially like rocks, things tend to kind of grow in a certain way and have like, you know, some movement to them. So that's kind of why I'm placing these rocks kind of like angular. Let's go ahead and just do something like this. And I'm just going to create a nice little like canyon for myself there. Do, do, do. Make it be a little natural there. All right. Cool, 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 cool. Work smarter, not harder. Just going to go ahead and grab all these kit pieces or these this rock kit. Let's go ahead and just kind of rotate them over here and just kind of like adjust things as I need them. And I would obviously do this in within my engine, but just for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to go ahead and just do it in Maya. Kind of make things a little bit interesting. Make that nice little S path or something. OK, cool, 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 cool. Got something like that going on now. Next up, I'm going to go ahead and start to actually, let me go ahead and move this over. Okay, just add yeah, this piece. Next up, I'm going to go ahead and just start to grab more of like the medium shapes of my kit. Like, let's say this gigantic boulder here. And I'm just going to go ahead and just start jamming it into the ground or jamming it into the side of my wall here. If I really needed to blend these pieces together, I can always, you know, use skirts or some other sort of, you know, model to kind of help blend or help that transition. But at the end of the day, you know, I'll probably end up sharing a lot of different materials um, across the board with these guys. So they should look pretty similar and kind of fit. So I'm not too worried about it. Like, oh, like, why is there like a really harsh seam or something like that? All right. And again, kind of working on like that nice little S path there. Every other one, little like leapfrog looking thing. Go ahead and do this. Um, it's also important to note that, like, even with more organic pieces, what you don't want to end up doing is scaling. You know what I mean? You want to make pieces in large, medium, and small forms, um, just so that you know you're not losing out on texture density. Even if you are using texturing, like, um, like with some sort of like world projection or world aligned texture, you still don't want to like, you know, these these bakes were baked at a certain texture density, and you know the tileable textures on them um, were meant to accommodate for that. So you don't want to be scaling this stuff just like you know willy nilly and you know, just hoping that it looks good or because then you'll have just a bunch of issues with text density and uh, text density is really important. Let's grab some of these more medium pieces. Or so I should say more of these like smaller pieces. Let's go ahead and just start like busting them around. Um, by the way, when it comes to placing these objects, I usually like to place, you know, if I have to place like a bunch of this kind of stuff, I'll place like one or two or three of them in a nice, like interesting way. Like, let's say like something like this guy. I'm just going to go ahead and place it like, let's say something like that. And then if I find a like a, a 
what's called a little piece like this that like looks nice and pretty. I'll usually end up just like grabbing this kind of stuff, and then I guess it's more of a set dressing note. Let's go actually like that one, and let's go ahead and make this one a little bit smaller, like that. I'll go ahead and just end up like you know, say merging it together or grabbing that cluster as a group or some of like that, and then rotating them, and placing them as a, a uh, like a a selection or a group. It just makes it sure that like hey, this is always going to look pretty no matter what angle you know I'm rotating or what no matter what angle I'm placing these. Um, it's always going to look nice and nice and blended together. Pretty much it's always going to look good. <laughs> let's go ahead and do something like that. Let's just jam that in here just a little bit there. And then let's go ahead and go back to my kit over here. Now I got some more of like, I guess more of these smaller, I guess even smaller pieces, I should say. Maybe some more pebble pieces, but I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of like quickly just kind of rotate this around here. Yeah. I'm just going to place this one just as kind of like a nice little blend. And usually when it comes to the more organic stuff, I always like to think of it as like kind of like, almost like a virus that it spreads. Usually things tend to grow or even fall in a very like natural way where it starts off with like the source. So in this case, this is giant rock, right? And then it goes down to bigger rocks. And as the further I get away from like the bigger rocks, I always tend to kind of like have like smaller pieces kind of bleed out. Um, and this works for foliage as well. Usually there's like a source or where like, you know, the center foliage is like probably the, you know, the patch of grass or the fern or whatever that is, you know, the center of where it started to grow. And the ones that, as it kind of like spreads out, those are like, you know, newer pieces and they kind of just tend to be smaller. Uh, but it also works for rocks and, and all that stuff. Uh, but next up, I'm going to go ahead and grab my blend piece here, which is my little mound. Let's go ahead and just start jamming that right in. And I get to kind of rotate this and flip this around here. And again, this is just blending more so with geometry. Um, you know, we can always do a texture pass on this later on as far as like skirting and, you know, making sure that the vertex blend looks good and whatnot. But just for the sake of testing out the kit itself and, you know, making sure that our kit looks nice and cool, you can see here that we're just kind of like getting all these pieces nice and good. Also, you might see like some, um, sometimes there's like even some mega scan assets that kind of like look like this. Anyways, that's kind of where, you know, a good reference point of like, oh, like, you know, what kind of mounds and pieces should I be? Kind of building like take a look at some more organic you know kits out there as reference let's go ahead and just kind of do something like that all right good nice little right there here and then last but not least we got some nice little pebbles and in this case these are pretty massive but that's okay let's go ahead and just kind of try probably in kind of scale <laughs> normally you don't want to you want to make sure that the text you're not breaking text settings but for the sake of this i just want to make sure that i'm getting a nice little little bleed off there but yeah something like that so hopefully that gives you an example of kind of like how we can end up using more organic hit pieces. They tend to just be very, you know, they can just jam right into each other, right? It's less about focusing on snapping and more so focusing on like, you know, how can I reuse these pieces in nice, interesting ways and how they can kind of like blend together. And again, it's just kind of focusing on like these big, medium, and then kind of like, you know, more of these smaller stuff and just kind of keep working your way down as much detail as you need. Um, but foliage works the exact same way. If this was like a giant tree right here, right, I would basically just have some like bigger plants or some medium ferns or something like that. And then I kind of get down to like, you know, more of like these grassy patches or grassy mounds or something, and then kind of get into more of like the mossy kind of stuff or flowers and things like that but all very, very similar. All right, so hopefully that kind of answers some questions there for you guys. Let's go ahead and jump on over to back to my little PowerPoint in here. And we'll jump into the second part of the demo here, which is going to be how we end up texturing this stuff, right? Because that's kind of really important. Um, pretty much as a rule of, of thumb, um, I always tend to kind of use more so palatable textures than anything. Um, I, I try to get away with as much table textures as possible just because I want to be able to make sure that I am actually sharing, um, you know, texture count. Because I would say, like, especially nowadays, polygon counts, I'm not going to say they're, you know, out the door. Like, you got really awesome things like, you know, Nanite and, uh, you know, even some cool tech stuff as far as, like, LEDs and, and things like that that can kind of help you out with geometry. But the big, I guess, like, a uh, bottleneck for environments um, is going to be how we end up texturing these guys, right? And if we can share tileable textures as often as possible, that's just going to make sure that our kits are, you know, not as expensive and that we can actually add more to the world. Because you got to remember, um, it's not just the environments, right? You also have characters on screen. You also have effects. You also have, you know, animations. Like, all this stuff has to be accounted for in real-time engines. And, you know, a big kind of save is, is how we end up texturing our assets, um, which is also just, like, a great 
note into like why we still build kits, right? Like why we still build things certain ways and why aren't we just like, you know, going out there and just like scanning something and calling it a day. Um, it's because we do want to make sure that all of this stuff is optimized and optimal. Um, and how we go about that a lot of times is us texturing. So I have, on the left here, I have an example of something like if you were going to end up sculpting one of these kit pieces, you would pretty much just have like some sort of sculpt and you would end up using some sort of tileable um, texture along with some masks. And I have to actually have an example of that in Unreal for you guys if you need it. Oh, well, if you need it, I'll show it to you guys in a second. Um, and then uh, I also do have a, an example over here where it's less more of the uh, it's more of the non baking work method, which is basically just using tileable textures and um, and trims of some sort. But at the end of the day, you will see that they are pretty much all using tileable texturing of some sort. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to my other Maya scene here. All right, so I wanted to kind of just uh, have my kit all laid out for you guys real quick here so you can see like at the end of the day that I will pretty much have all of my kit pieces all textured in the same scene. And actually what my scene normally looks like on any given day is probably a little bit more so like this <laughs> um, and not so spread out. I could uh, I have a script or something like that that kind of like sets them all into the same space. But usually my kits end up, my kit environments end up looking something like this, right? But this is just an example of it all kind of laid out inside of, um, inside of Maya for you guys when it's textured. But on that note, let's go ahead and take a look at kind of a piece like this first. Let's go ahead and just kind of put my rock off to the side because we'll talk about the rock in a second. But I usually end up having my textures, all my textures that I ended up making for this scene, whether it be trims, tilers, or whatever, just laid out inside of my Maya environment and pretty much on a plane that demonstrates the size of this uh, of their textures. In this case, I'm using 1024s as kind of like my you know size of my texturing method, just so I can kind of keep my texture count kind of low. Um, that will make the so that it repeats more often, but my kit pieces, uh, but my scene will be a little bit more optimized that way. And if I always needed to like bump up for text density or some of that, I can always bump these up to a 2K and all of a sudden my text density is no longer, let's say 512 per, per meter, but now it's 1024 per meter, right? Um, so there's always different ways that you can kind of up res when you start with like a, something that's a little bit you know, lower. Uh, but this will mean, uh, but anyways, let's get back into the uh, unwrapping portion, portion of this. Um, so yeah, like I said, I have all these at the ready. These are all of the different textures that I can use to kind of texture um, this particular kit piece. And let's go ahead and just talk about kind of like how I end up unwrapping. So this might be a little bit different if you guys don't use Maya, um, but it's all pretty much the exact same workflow of just kind of trying to get away with tileable textures at first. And then if I need more detail, I can make trim sheets. And if for some reason my kit piece still doesn't look, you know, super duper awesome in some way or another, um, I could always just go to that route of using tileable textures in some sort of baked, uh, baked kind of workflow. But let's go ahead and start with this guy first. I'm just going to start with the biggest first, the biggest uh, uh, offenders first, or the biggest surfaces first, which is going to be, you know, this back face right here. I'm literally just going to go ahead and just like auto quickly auto unwrap and pull up my UV editor for a second, just so it has some sort of so many UVs. All right, let's go ahead and just kind of put this over here. I'm just going to move this all off to the side for a second here. This is kind of just my general way of unwrapping. Let's just go ahead and say that this stuff wasn't unwrapped at all. So I'm just going to put it off to the side. All right, so the nice thing about using tileable textures and like, you know, I guess one big benefit to this workflow in general and making sure that your kit pieces are on the grid is that a lot of times you can kind of just get away with just like almost auto unwrapping your UVs or using some sort of planar wrap UVs. Let's go ahead and just assign this wallpaper texture real quick here. Do, 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 do. All right, take a look at this. And when I'm, um, but pretty much like, unless I wanted to make sure that like my wood grain is going the right way, or maybe I want to make sure that like, let's say like this, this face right here, Oops, let's go make sure that snaps. This face, which is pretty much that backside. Sorry if I'm like covering it up, but it's pretty much that backside. It's probably facing the exact right way or the right orientation. Um, but other than that, like this piece right here, any place that's going to be using just straight up tileables, I can literally just go down to my text density, making sure that it's, let's say, at a 512 per meter, right? Which is the text density that I was using for this environment. Um, and then right here, whoops, as far as like 1020, 2048s, um, I think I do. No, I want to keep it at a 2K for now, but my text identity will remain the exact same. Anyways, if I go ahead and just click set, this piece is pretty much unwrapped, right? And you might, you might be asking yourself, like, John, like, how does that affect, like, uh, you know, like, will it tile with itself? Um, if my other kit pieces are also, you know, my UV seams line up uh, properly, I can pretty much just make sure that, like, look at that, it, like, seams up perfectly. Um, and that's because I built my kit pieces in a way that, you know, the, the edge is on the actual uh, grid. So I don't have to worry too much about like whether or not this thing seems together, you know, 
in any form or the other. Um, so it's kind of nice. I might want to have a geometry piece in there in between just to kind of, you know, break up just the overall look of my kit. Um, but for the most part, I shouldn't have to worry too much about whether, you know, the tileable texture actually tiles. Um, but that, you know, just being able to auto unwrap and then making sure that the things are in the right orientation. These, this part of my kit or this part of this piece is pretty much done. And it doesn't matter where I really move it unless I wanted like, you know, this stuff to line up perfectly, I might end up snapping it like right there, for example, here. Just kind of put them over there. And then we're pretty much done with that stuff. And anytime I'm done with like my unwrap, I end up just putting it over to the left somewhere. Um, I can actually use this transform over here as well, just to kind of move it exactly one unit over so I don't lose my UVs. Let's just put it over there for a moment. All right, there we go. But that part of my kit is done. And that's the easy stuff, right? So that's why we always like to use tileables when we can. Um, as far as like breaking up that surface, I'll end up using things like vertex paint and and uh, um, you know even decals and stuff like that to help ground it um, to make it look like more like that like a quote unquote prop. Um, but for the sake of using tileables, you know we're sharing those textures. We're done with that with that section of the piece. Um, the next stuff is going to be more so these like trims and tileables. And so whenever I'm unwrapping trims, it's pretty straightforward um as far as like i guess i should say creating my trim sheet i should probably talk about that first um i always tend to create my trim sheets off of the geometry that um i've used for my kit so let's say like even let's say i didn't have a trim sheet quite yet right and i just had this kit piece just off to the side i'll actually end up going ahead and like grabbing like let's say like this whole trim because i know that's going to be an easy trim or maybe even this section right here right i'll just go ahead and just like delete it and this is kind of how i plan out my trims as well I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of flip and rotate it for a second there. And let's go ahead and say I'm going to start to make my texture piece, which is going to be just kind of like, whoops, this plane over here. Let's go ahead and make sure that this is set properly. Let's go ahead and set it to, I think it's like 400. We'll be exactly on my grid. Oops, 200. I'm doing a 2, a 1024 texture. But pretty much what I can do now for this is I can go ahead and just start to, let's say like this trim goes all the way around, right? I'll just grab that little section, maybe like select everything, deselect that, hit delete for a second. Make sure I get, just go ahead and separate these pieces. But as you can see, like I'm going to make sure that every, when I, everything on my trim sheet, I'm going to end up using at the end of the day because it literally was built from my, my geometry, right? I know I'm going to find use for it in some form or another. Right, and so this is how I actually end up planning out my trim sheet. Is I'll find pieces in my scene that kind of make a little bit, uh, you know, that I know I'm gonna, that I'm probably gonna want to use a trim sheet on, and just kind of make sure that I line things up. And then I end up sculpting this, or even you know, texturing it, you know, in some other program or, or whatnot. But as you can see, like I'm actually use, utilizing like the pieces. Maybe something like this might be a little bit weird because like you know, it's got a lot of different dimensions to it, and even those UVs would be a lot flatter. So like maybe something for this, I might not want like these this entire archway. That feels a little bit weird, but now we're getting so more so into like, you know, making trims than actually unwrapping kit pieces. But I just want to kind of just demonstrate for you guys, like I probably wouldn't put that piece there. And if anything, I'd probably put just like a slither of wood and call that a day. But yeah, and that's actually what I ended up using for this trim sheet. As a matter of fact, is I have a nice little slither of wood. I got some like, you know, wainscoting pieces down here that I actually built that are actually built from my wainscoting geometry. And then I got some nice little geometry breakup of like details and whatnot. Um, but that's what I'll end up using to kind of texture that piece there. So let's go ahead and just start off with this guy here. I'm just gonna go ahead and just grab like, let's say like, start off with this piece right here actually. All righty. And I'll go ahead and just like, anything that's still work in progress, I like to keep over here on the right side of my UVs and everything that's still like, you know, not quite done yet, is gonna be over here on my left. So let's go ahead and just like grab that piece here. Sorry, kind of do, hard to do this with all with one screen. Usually I have two monitors going on. Let's go ahead and just assign existing material. And I'm going to go ahead and assign my trim here for a second. So whenever I'm going ahead and unwrapping these pieces, I'm just going to go ahead and just like kind of seam them up together and break it up as I need it. So let's go ahead and just kind of stitch together for a moment. Stitch all that together. It's all good. Let's go ahead and make sure that it's fully unwrapped. So if I go to my unfold and I unfold along like, you know, horizontally and vertically, just to kind of make sure that piece is, you know, nice and unwrapped the way it's supposed to. I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that my text density is proper. So I'm going to go ahead and click set for my text density. Everything looks like it matches up nice and easy. And now pretty much I can basically go and look at my geometry piece over here and start to um, ask myself like, okay, like, do I need like, where do I want to, where do I want to fit this geometry on my trim sheet so that it matches up in a very, you know, realistic way. I'm going to go ahead and start off with like the edges first. I always think like that stuff that like a, 
the occluded areas and the edge areas are kind of important to make sure that they have like that kind of detail. So let's go ahead and grab like all that whole trim here, which is pretty much going to be this whole thing. I'm just going to grab this vertice here, cut it up. And now I'm just going to basically look for anywhere on my trim sheet that looks good, <laughs> honestly. Like I could find like the one to one piece that I ended up using to bake out that trim, or I can just find something that kind of looks, you know, pretty neat. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and find like a couple edges there, like something like, let's say like, where's this exact face here so I can find that face. That's going to be this face. All right, so this face here, let's go ahead and just kind of like find something like, and if I need to, I can always just cut up these pieces. So let's say like I want to cut like this piece here because that looks a little bit weird under the side. Go ahead and find somewhere on my trim sheet that this kind of makes sense. Let's go ahead and find like a crevice there. And pretty much what I'm kind of keeping an eye on the whole time is my trim up here. And as long as it looks good on my geometry, it doesn't really doesn't matter where I'm putting my trim sheet. In fact, that actually doesn't look no, a little bit too bad there. But again, what you're trying to keep an eye on is like the edge wear and the occluded areas. Let's go ahead and grab like this other face right here as well. Do, 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 do. Go ahead and do flip flip just to kind of separate those pieces out. Again, make sure my text identity is all good to go. And then I'm just going to go ahead and find somewhere on my trim. In this case, it looks like, like, you know, let's say like I wanted to like utilize this whole space here. I could kind of scale things up and it probably would look fine, but I'm going to try to find somewhere that kind of like makes a little bit more sense. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and like find this area right here. And sometimes what I'll end up doing too is I'll end up cutting up my geometry if for some reason, like, let's say I look at my trim for a moment. I'm like, oh, that's really cool, but maybe I want to like have like that detail, you know, below it as well. So let's go ahead back to my UVs for a second. I'll end up adding like an actual like, edge loop in here just to accommodate for that. So let's go ahead and just kind of add an edge loop right there. Let's find this little section here. I'll just go ahead and just flip it so I can kind of separate it off. It looks like actually this thing is upside down. So let's go ahead and just like flip and rotate that. Something like that. And then for this piece down here, maybe I want to just find something that's a little bit more, you know, subtle, not so noisy, not too much detail. Let's just find like, let's say like this little occluded area there. And honestly, when it comes down to this stuff, if I have to scale it just a little bit, it's not, too, not the end of the world, right? My text density went from like, you know, let's say like 512 per meter to like 480 something or something like that. No one's going to be like, oh my gosh, John doesn't look right. It'll look fine. All right, so you got a piece like that going on here. Um, for some of these more archways kind of pieces, it's a little bit actually easier to unwrap. So let's go ahead and like grab like just this one for example here. Let's go ahead and just kind of auto unwrap this for a second. I always start off with an auto. Whoa, 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 whoa! Didn't look good. What did I do? Did I break something? Nope. Auto unwrap. There we go. And then luckily, if you guys know Maya, there's a nice little modify unitize area there. Let's go ahead and grab like something like this. Deselect all of that. I'm just gonna go ahead and actually let me separate this. Let me isolate it so it doesn't look super duper crazy complex. Looks like I don't need these pieces in here, so I'm just going to make sure that there's no geometry under there. Looks like somewhere along the line, I still have like some sort of try somewhere. I'll find that a little bit later on. Oops. Why does it look like this thing is subdivided? Did I do something weird to it? Ah! Looks like I added like a bevel or something. Did out of a bevel. Sorry, I made this piece more complicated than it needs to be, and that's my bad as far as geometry, geometry goes. Let's go ahead and just kind of modify unitize it still. Let's see if we can kind of get it right without actually doing this. Without actually having to worry about that or rebuild it. All right, let's go ahead and just find our seam here. I'm just going to go ahead and say my seam is going to be somewhere around here. If I go ahead and just stitch it together, let it think for a second. Hopefully it doesn't crash on me. And I think it's done enough thinking. I'm going to press escape. There you go. Boom. All right, so it looks like I got some weird, funky pieces going on here. But for the most part, see where all these pieces are right here. What's going on here? Like somewhere along the lines. I don't know why it's subdivided. I'm sorry about that, guys. It looks like it's like cut up certain ways. But let's just focus on the other piece right here. Let's go ahead and just flip it and separate it out there. I don't know what's going on there for a second here. I swear, sometimes I, uh, not sometimes, but I usually model a lot cleaner than this. For some reason, I don't know what happened, but. There we go. Just kind of separate that out for a second there. I'll worry about those pieces in a moment. Let's just grab that general arch for a moment here. Let's go ahead and just kind of make sure that I grab all these UVs. I'm just going to unfold along the V. Oops, not that. I got to deselect my outer edge there. Unfold along the V. And now I get something that kind of looks like this. Select those vertices up in here. Fold along the V. 
pull up only the U. Oops. Let's go ahead and straighten UVs out for a second. Let it think. Come on. Ah. Now I'm just like, get to watch me unwrap really nasty stuff all of a sudden. <laughs> My bad, guys. Um, I swear, this is usually a lot easier. And it's probably because my geometry looks like crap. All right, I might have to jump out of this one. Bailing out of this. But hopefully this kind of already starts to give you guys just the general workflow as far as like utilizing trims. I'm basically just going to find pieces on my geometry that I would, that I like, I want to do like maybe like a trim sheet here or tableable textures as, as often as possible. And then trim sheets kind of like where I need them as far as the detail pieces. One kind of like, I guess, flow that's kind of nice is always like that sandwich technique if you guys understand it or if you guys know that one i should say um <laughs> uh, is kind of like you know let's say like up here the trim sheet is almost like my quote unquote detail kind of piece and the tileable textures are just going to be straight up tileable textures that i'll have to ground later on uh with skirts and decals um so i always like to think like okay like let's go ahead and just do like maybe this piece won't be it might be a tiler piece and then this can be unwrapped with trim and then this and this will be a tiler piece again and then this will Part will be kind of trim. Um, I try to use trims as often as possible, though, um, where I can, just because that will actually have that one-to-one -one detail that you might see from a piece like this. It'll actually have, you know, that cavity information that that dust build up and stuff like that. Whereas a tileable, tileable is pretty much just like a flat surface that might just have, you know, some detail in the grain or something like that. Um, so it really is about like trying to utilize this as often as I can. But if I can get away with the tileable texture, I definitely will. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and just jump on over to the more organic stuff of this, which is going to be this rock guy over here. Um, and then the unwrapping magic for this guy isn't really super duper special. I've already kind of unwrapped this guy. Um, just as like kind of a general guide here. And it looks kind of just like, you know, a decimated model. And that's because it is. Um, the way I unwrap this one in particular, I just went ahead and used like ZBrush's unwrap and it kind of just selected certain parts of my model um, to make sure that it was unwrapped. But if I wanted to go ahead and unwrap this with like, um, it's like I guess a little bit more of a better unwrap, pretty much what I would end up doing is using a technique that I learned from a, um, a coworker of mine, a buddy of mine, uh, Danny Carlone. He has like a really great uh, way to kind of unwrap this stuff. And actually, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Um, if I go look up his Instagram, it's actually super duper great. All right, give me a second here. Let me pull it up for you guys. Do, 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 do. And it's actually this workflow right here. Which if I open this up just for a quick second, and of course, there you go, it's on Twitter there. But it's a little hard to see, but you can definitely look at um, his stuff up. But it's pretty much this idea of making a lower poly model, unwrapping that, and then using what we have in Maya, which is the transfer attributes. So I basically get to unwrap a very simple model and then you know transfer the UVs onto a more complicated model, uh, which is the, the general workflow. And you can definitely take a look at that guide, but that's probably what I would end up using to unwrap a piece like this. Um, or RISM is kind of a great way to go, if you guys do, do know RISM. Um, but for this piece, just for the uh, sake of like uh, I should say, sake of this demo, I just went ahead and used um, UV uh, ZBrush's uh, unwrapper. And honestly, something like this for a rock is totally fine. The only time the UVs kind of like I guess like the direction of your UV layout actually matters the most is when you're going to be using things like uh, wood grain or something like that. In that case, I would probably want to make sure that let's say like my wood grain was you know horizontal. I would probably want to make sure that my you know my UVs all kind of have like a very like horizontal kind of look. Um, based on where they are. But that's the only difference between like unwrapping like a rock piece or versus like a organic wood piece or something like that or any type of surface really. It's just making sure that, you know, it goes with the grain of, of whatever material that you're trying to utilize. But let's go ahead and just jump over to Unreal for a moment here where I can show you guys what um, what I'm actually setting up inside of Unreal as far as the shader goes. And we can take a look at, go ahead and get rid of these guys over here. We can take a look at that shader under the hood. All right. So I got this giant rock in here. I went ahead and textured it um, just quick, quickly with like some substance painter masks and just tileable textures. And I can actually show you guys how this is all working out here. Um, pretty much what I have here is I have just like a, a general tileable rock texture. And then I also have like a variant of it just for surface breakup, which is in this case, just a more desaturated version. But I can use an entirely different rock texture if I have one. Um, that rock texture has a normal map, and then it also has just some pack channels, which are literally just the ambient occlusion, the height map. I didn't need my normal map in here. I'm oh, sorry, my 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 metalness map in here. So I just have my roughness map in channel one, you know, my AO in channel two, and then my uh, height map in channel and my blue channel, just in case I need it. But that's pretty much all I needed for as far as like palatable textures go. 
And what I ended up importing for this unique uh, kit piece is all I ended up needing was a normal map and then a pack channel, which is basically just a couple different masks that define the look of my rock. So I know it's kind of hard to see in here, but this is one for edge wear. I also have one for, you know, occluded areas, which is like the dust buildup and, you know, dirt and stuff like that. And I also have another one that is just for general surface breakup. But those are the three masks I en end up using for pretty much any sculpted, you know, piece that I'm trying to texture is I'll have, yeah, again, one for edges, one for cavity information, and one for surface breakup. And this way, it'll allow me to kind of utilize, you know, this shader setup to get lots of different variation to it and texture all my kit pieces. Um, pretty much once you have this setup going, you can actually end up texturing all your kits that are sharing the same towels an infinite number of ways. And let's say if I needed like a new rock kit or something like that, I can literally just swap out like the tileable texture of my um of my shader and I can get a whole new look, right? Maybe in, in another shader I end up like, you know, making like some, I don't know, white rocks or something like that, or maybe some sort of obsidian rock or something like that. I can still use the exact same sculpt, but allow myself the freedom to, you know, have a different look for my area. Let's go ahead and take a look at this shader under the hood real quick here just to kind of show you how it's built up. But pretty much what I have here is I have four different layers to my texture. Um, in this case, I have the tileable texture one. And these are all, by the way, just material functions inside of Unreal. Um, yeah, layer one, layer two, which is basically just the same exact texture. Um, I also have a mask or a, a shader in here. That's literally just for color information right now. But this is pretty much going to be what defines the edges of my uh, my rock. And then I also have something right here where I could probably uh, what's whoops, load it off screen. Where I can probably actually tile it like a dirt texture in here if I really wanted to, um, just to kind of get, you know, better looking. But in this case, just for the example, I just kind of had just a simple color. But each one of these can be their own tileable textures if I needed them to be. Um, but for the sake of this, they're just going to be some simple colors. But yeah, pretty much I have four different layers to define the look of my kit models. And for a kit piece, this can all kind of vary, um, you know, but it just depends on like, a, I, sorry, for a kit piece, I can always kind of change the look of each different rock as I need to. Um, and just allows for just a lot of uh, you know freedom. Um, but let's go ahead and just take a look at this um, shader exactly under the RGB mask master here. So as you can see, it's actually not super duper complex what's going on. Um, each one of these material functions is being called in here. So I have like my, my rock tiler, I have like uh, the rock tiler that's kind of like more desaturated. So my second rock tiler, and pretty much it's just an alpha that's being uh, that's telling like, hey, where should like a you know this one show up and where should this one show up? So one little alpha basically controlling that whole blend. And by the way, these are like roughness, metalness, you know, AO occlusion, all that stuff. It's all being blended within these material functions here. And I'm basically just tackling it in layers, right? Next up, I have like my dirt layer, and then it's just one single mask that is being um, you know called on. And then the last one is just going to be like you know edge wear which is being called in for my red channel. And I just have a simple texture for that. And again, this, this, these material functions can hold an entire tileable texture if I needed to be. Um, what really, where the magic really comes in hand, or I guess where, like, where this like texturing this kit workflow really comes like into play, is kind of how I'm blending the normal maps um, of these tileable, so yeah, of these tileable textures and adding my unique model in here. So if I go ahead and just kind of put these UVs over, or these two maps over here, um, so normally when you guys are like texturing like a prop or something like that, right, you'll probably texture something that's like just a color map, you'll bring in your normal map, and maybe some sort of like pack texture, which is like your roughness, your AO, and all that good stuff, right? Um, but when you're doing this workflow, all you really need is two textures for your bake. So every single one of my rocks will only have just two textures instead of, you know, your normal probably three or four, um, right? And that's kind of like where you start to save in this workflow is that I, all I ever need for like that one rock is this a normal map, which is basically just, you know, the bake of my model. And then I have something like this, which is just a couple different masks defining the look of my, right? Everything else is going to be utilizing the same tileable textures. Um, and then I actually also have down here uh, a detail tileable texture, which I can just kind of like overlay normals on top of my model just to get an extra, you know, specific detail, especially if my rocks are a little bit bigger than, you know, my average grid or something like that, or a larger model in general. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all just being kind of blended in and, you know, all good to go. But let's go ahead and just take a look at kind of, whoops, go ahead and save this out here. And that's just the master material that I have going on here. This is just the material instance real quick here that I have. Um, pretty much I just sent a quick little hint to like my dirt and my color. And then I just have the weight, like the number of how much I'm tiling my textures. Let's go ahead and take a look at do, 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 do. a rock here. Let's go ahead and just kind of run around it here. All right, so just so I can kind of see what these guys are doing in real time. 
Oh, uh, whoops, sorry about that. I'll just kind of leave it there at this. It's all right. All right, anyways, so if I go over to my detail tolerable texture, I also have something that's for the intensity of my detail tolerable normal. There's a parameter for that. But if I go ahead and control, like, let's say, like, you know, the detail tiling of my rock, like, let's say these are the big forms, or these are, this is how much my, my actual tileable texture is tiling on my model. I can kind of just mess with that and allow myself to kind of like, you know, make up for the text latency. By the way, the numbers that I end up putting in here, like how much I end up tiling my texture is actually dictated by, in Maya, my UVs, right? Because we want to keep the text latency as best as we possibly can, right? If I grab these UVs and I go ahead and say get, I'm looking at this and this is like roughly, you know, about 64 texels per meter, right? Um, because this is such low res, as far as like what I'm trying to aim for, which is a 512 texture per meter, I'm going to start to want to tile my tileable textures inside of my en game engine to compensate for the lack of resolution. So if we go back over to Unreal real quick here, obviously this thing is really, really low res as far as like the overall like normal map bake. And if anything, I would probably want to make sure that my sculpt is a little bit sharper um, to make sure that that bake is really coming through. Um, but as far as like resolution goes, I'm going to probably want to make up for it with my tileable textures. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and tile like, let's say like a 2K texture about like, you know, four different times. And then I'm going to start to want to add some more of the more micro detail with this kind of like micro tileable texture. So I end up with something like this. And this is pretty much how we always end up like, you know, texturing large assets or even taking, texturing any sort of like, um, you know, kit that requires the same kind of materials and then, you know, just different masks, um, you know, per rock, I should say. Um, but this is just one little uh, way that we kind of go about, like, I guess one way. This is the, the method that you would probably want to go about texturing more organic kit pieces in general. Even if it was like a pillar or, you know, some sort of architectural piece, you still probably want to utilize palables as much as you possibly can just to limit the number of materials that you're bringing into the engine. Um, because if you just start bringing a bunch of one-off props and stuff like that, not only does it take away the flexibility to kind of like, let's say, like, change all my, you know, tinting of my dirt to, you know, whatever color I want, we get a different look going on. Um, but it's also going to like just cause more uh, memory on like the, uh, like your, your texture limit. It's going to you know, just kind of push you above that texture limit because you're bringing in a new tileable texture each time. Because from here on out, let's say I wanted to texture all my kit pieces this way, all I ever need is just these two textures, right? And then I'll be good to go for each model. And these will be different uh, material instances or material functions for every rock. But that's pretty much like kind of how we go about texturing more organic assets, right? Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Let's go ahead and jump back over to my, let's see how we're doing on time. All right, doing pretty good. Let's go ahead and jump over to the uh, last couple slides here that I have for the demo. So we talked a little bit about texturing with kit models and how we kind of go about using tables and textures. Um, but now I wanted to kind of just touch this up. I don't really have an example for you guys as far as like, I mean, I guess I can pull up something in that scene that kind of replicates this, but it is worth noting that I have four different ways that I usually go about, or four different ways that we almost always go about kind of like blending assets together and making sure that they look like props or they look grounded or they look, you know, awesome together. Um, and it just really depends on like, you know, how much detail you want to add to your guys' instruments. But more often than not, we almost always use some form of, you know, vertex blending to kind of break up those tileable textures. Um, we'll end up using like four or five, you know, different layers of tileables um, to just get surface variation and to help ground these assets together and help blend them together. Like, let's say like I had like a, you know, a dirt floor with moss on it. And then that rock that I had also has like a moss shader on it. I can start to blend my kit pieces together a little bit more organically, right? Um, I also have, you, know, you can also utilize things like decals that are like floater, floater geometry, and that can kind of help round models together. It's also a great way to kind of like, let's say like, you know, instead of like a, a like, let's say like, I know it's kind of hard to see, but actually let's go back over to my kit real quick here. I have an example of this. Let's go back over here. Actually, I have an example of this real quick here, but I don't know if you guys can see this okay here, but I do actually have a little skirt model on my actual kit piece that allows there to be some sort of transition between my ground and my floor. I also have it right here as well, just to kind of help blend that stuff just a little bit better. And it's just a little something, a technique that I kind of learned um, on like, you know, working on Call of Duty is that we end up skirting a lot of different models to kind of help, you know, ground them just a little bit better. Um, but yeah, just having a little bit of a transition there is also a great way to kind of like help blend your kit pieces um, even, even better or more seamlessly. Um, the next one is also just like world projection. So this is like if you wanted to get, you know, snow or, you know, moss or yeah, anything kind of just world projected on your guys' kit pieces, you could definitely go this route um, for more organic stuff, and it's probably the way to go. And then last but not least is like skirt models and stuff like that. So again, I do have another kit piece here. 
I kind of utilize that, which is this guy real quick here. So this is just a little bit of a mound. Whoops, I'm going to turn off my grid for a second here just so I can kind of utilize this guy. But pretty much this will allow for just like a more seamless transition between my kit models, right? And we use this a lot for organics or even if you're doing like something that's a little bit more, you know, rubble pieces or whatnot. And it's just a great way to kind of like, you know, help seam all this stuff together, right? Help with transitions, right? Help blend things together is kind of the name of the game for this last little bit. Um, but I will only end up adding this stuff to my kit towards the end or even worrying about this kind of stuff once I get kind of like the foundation of my kit ready to go. Um, but on blending with textures, you know, I mean, these are kind of like the four big ways that we use a lot. Um, and the next up here, I also have blending with geometry, which is uh, pretty much like what you saw with that rock kit, where it was kind of just like jamming pieces in. I usually end up using some sort of like rubble pile or even some sort of like scattered debris, which is kind of like that little cluster of pebbles that I had going on. And then also we have some things like, you know, foliage, right, is a great way to kind of hide seams and transition things together. Um, so, yeah, like let's say you had like a rock kit and you had like that architecture kit that I had, you know, having some foliage on both is going to help, you know, blend between the two uh, pieces there, right? Um, but that's pretty much what I got for those two. And then one thing that I also wanted to kind of touch on real quick here, as far as like kits goes, is just more so the um, thought or I guess the practice of kit batching, right? Um, sometimes you'll have like somebody create a kit for like, let's say like some sort of architecture or something like that. And, you know, another kit that's for like, you know, maybe some like metal pipes or something. And the idea of mashing those two kits together to build out even new kit pieces is usually what we refer to as kit bashing, right? It's basically taking an asset and just constructing something new out of it. Um, I have this example right here on my art station if you guys wanted to check out. Um, but this is pretty much a kit that I created purely just for props with inside of um, um, in Asgard. And it was basically just so I can kind of like start to fill up the scene a little bit without having to like outsource too many different props or even add in too many one off, you know, uh, you know, textures, right? Because each one of those props has, again, their own color, their own roughness, their own, you know, normal map, their own one-off stuff. But in this case, I'm basically just reusing this exact same kit. And once I textured it with one shader, these are all sharing the same shaders, right? It's not like I had to make a new shader for each one. They're all pretty much the same. Maybe I made an instance of one of these shaders if I wanted to, like, tint one of these wood pieces. But for the most part, they're all the exact same. And so I'm limiting the number of draw calls that I'm bringing into the scene. Um, at the end of the day. But having a nice little kit like this can just allow you to make a lot of different variations and a lot of different pieces that you might not have you know, known how to tackle. So yeah, just another way that we can utilize kits a lot. And then, um, yeah, we're getting towards the end here. Um, so I just kind of wanted to uh, sum it all up. Um, pretty much up at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to kind of doing kits, um, is that we are trying to create an optimal and reusable assets um, using a pipeline that's very non-destructive as possible. Um, this way we can always go back to any spot in the process. Like if I need to go back into ZBrush or something like that and uh, you know make some changes, it's not gonna just completely mess up everything that I ever wanted to, like I was ever doing, right? Um, because I am using a lot of tileables and because I am using a lot of like, you know, you know reusable kit pieces, um, I can base. I don't have to go back to my my environment inside of Unreal and kind of like you know fix things if they're like one off and stuff like that. So it really is all about kind of consolidating the number of assets and the number of materials that you guys are bringing into the engine, kind of like controlling that footprint. Um, and if it seems a little bit excessive as far as like games go, and you might be thinking like, oh, you know, like we could start adding more to games and stuff like that. You also got to remember that. You know, this is just one part of game creation. You know, I mean, there is other aspects to games as far as like, you know, characters and, and, and you know, animations and effects and all that stuff. And we are all, you know, fighting for that budget a little bit. And it is really a give and take. And if we can be more optimal with our environments in general, um, we can just allow for more variation, right? Like if I make a very optimal kit that is sharing a lot of different, you know, assets and textures, um, you know, I can allow for, you know, more props in my environment or, you know, better lighting or, you know, better shadows or something like that, or, you know, even just more effects going on. Um, so it really is about kind of like, you know, carrying your own weight. And I've I have found this to be very, very useful in general, you know, when it comes to joining the industry is that like, Utilizing this kit workflow, even in my personal projects, has you know allowed me to be, I guess, more useful on the job as far as like being able to hold my own. Um, so it is something worth demonstrating in your guys' portfolios, I think, if uh, if games are what you want to end up doing. Um, and then on that note, um, I also do have some like really cool art station links that I've just kind of found really really helpful. Um, I'm not going to open up each one real quick here. I actually have a, another window open up. Um, but some people have just done you know even better examples than I have <laughs> on my art station of just like different ways that you can kind of utilize kits. So this one right here is just a great one for, you know, kit bashing. Um, highly recommend you checking out that link. And this is from like six years ago. Like it's, it's 
a, a very well-known technique, you know, this this kit stuff. But it is worth kind of practicing and getting your hands um, hands dirty um, on your own. I have another one up here just for like different kind of kits for just like you know, let's say like ways you can blend things together, making like debris and moss and stuff like that. So this one's always a great one. Um, there's another link in here about like kind of like how to utilize you know trim sheets that I always reference all the time. Um, another great one here just about like you know making it just like more of a smaller kit like for pipes and stuff like that, and having that just being reused across the board, even with different textures and different shaders. It's all about just kind of how your shaders are hooked up, but it's using utilizing the exact same kit pieces and even the exact same trim sheet, which is great. Um, another one right here, if you guys are just looking to kind of check out some architecture in general. Like this uh, this kit, I imagine, has probably an interior kit as well, if, if, you, if you're planning on walking on the inside. Um, but it's all just reusing the same kind of pieces just over in different ways and making sure that they kind of snap together like Lego pieces, right? And then last but not least, um, you know, Timo, the, the, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, he has like just a really, really great breakdown on his art station about like doing rocks and more organic pieces and kind of how he ends up building all this stuff and blending it all together. Um, so highly recommend you guys check out these links. Um, but these are just ones that I've kind of collected over the years and uh, that I like to kind of keep at the ready in hand in case I need a reference or, or even talk about him, right? Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I got for you guys today. Um, if you guys have any questions, so feel free to ask away. Thank you so much, John Arolano, for taking your time and sharing this workshop with us. These workshops are only made possible because we have so many lovely Patreon supporters, and I want to thank each and every one of them for making our community a thriving place for learning and growth. If you also want to become one of these artists and level up your own environment art skills, then please head on over to beyondextent.com where you can become a member of our community, where we also offer weekly work reviews, a 250-page book full of tips, portfolio reviews, and much more. All of the links can be found in the description down below. Stay creative, and I hope to see you there.